Chapter Two of the Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Ground Ships Threaten. One of our Wyoming girls, on contact guard near Pocono, blundered into a hunting camp of the Bad Bloods, one of the renegade American gangs which occupied the Blue Mountain section north of Delaware Water Gap. We had not invited their cooperation in this campaign, for they were under some suspicion of having trafficked with the Hans in past years, but they had offered no objection to our passage through their territory in our advance on New York. Fortunately, our contact guard had been able to leap into the upper branches of a tree without being discovered by the Bad Bloods, for their discipline was lax and their guard careless. She overheard enough of the conversation of their bosses around the campfire beneath her to indicate the general nature of the Han plans. After several hours, she was able to leap away unobserved through the topmost branches of the trees, and after putting several miles between herself and their camp, she ultraphoned a full report to her contact boss back in the Wyoming Valley. My own ultraphone field boss picked up the message and brought the graph record of it to me at once. Her report was likewise picked up by the bosses of the various gang units in our line, and we had called a council to discuss our plans by word of mouth. We were gathered in a sheltered glade on the eastern slope of First Mountain on a balmy night in May. Far to the east, across the forested slopes of the lowlands, the flat stretches of open meadow and the rocky ridge that once had been Jersey City, the iridescent glow of New York's protecting film of annihilation shot upward, gradually fading into a starry sky. In the faint glow of our ultronoscopes, I made out the great figure and rugged features of Boss Kossaman, commander of the Mifflin unit, and the gray uniform of Boss Warren, who led the sand snipers of the Barnegat beaches, and who had swooped over from his headquarters on Sandy Hook. By his side stood Boss Handon of the Winslows, a gang from central Jersey. In the group also were the leaders of the Altoonas, the Camerons, the Lycomings, the Susquannas, Haggersduns, Chesters, Reddings, Delawares, Elmirans, Klugas, Hudsons, and Conadegas. Most of them were clad in forest green uniforms that showed black at night, but each had some distinctive badge or item of uniform or equipment that distinguished his gang. Both the Mifflin and Altoona bosses, for instance, wore heavy-looking boots with jointed knees. They came from sections that were not only mountainous, but rocky, where leaping involves many a slip and bruised limb unless some protection of this sort is worn. But these boots were not as heavy as they looked, being counterbalanced somewhat with a neutron. The headgear of the Winslows was quite different from the close-fitting helmet of the Wyomings, being large and bushy-looking, for in the Winslow territory there were many stretches of nearly bare land, with occasional scrubby pines, and a Winslow caught in the open on the approach of a Han airship would twist himself into a motionless imitation of a scrubby plant that passed very successfully for the real thing when viewed from several thousand feet in the air. The Susquannas had a unit that was equipped with inertron shields that were of the same shape as those of the ancient Romans, but much larger and capable of concealing their bearers from head to foot when they crouched slightly. These shields, of course, were colored forest green and were irregularly shaded. They were balanced with inertron so that their effective weight was only a few ounces. They were curious, too, in that they had handles for both hands and two small reservoir rocket guns built into them as integral parts. In going into action, the Susquannas crouched slightly, holding the shields before them with both hands, looking through a narrow vision slit, and working both rocket guns. The shields, however, were a great handicap in leaping and in advancing through heavy forest growth. The field unit of the Delawares was also heavily armored. It was one of the most efficient bodies of shock troops in our entire line. They carried circular shields about three feet in diameter, with a vision slit and a small rocket gun. These shields were held at arm's length in the left hand on going into action. In the right hand was carried an axe gun, an affair not unlike the battle axe of the Middle Ages. It was about three feet long. The shaft consisted of a rocket gun with an axe blade near the muzzle and a spike at the other end. It was a terrible weapon. Jointed leg guards protected the axe gunner below the rim of his shield, 
and a hemispherical helmet, the front section of which was of transparent ultron reaching down to the chin, completed his equipment. The Susquannas also had a long gun unit in the field. One company of my Wyomings I had equipped with a weapon which I designed myself. It was a long gun which I had adapted for bayonet tactics such as American troops used in the First World War in the 20th century. It was about the length of the ancient rifle and was fitted with a short knife bayonet. The stock, however, was replaced by a narrow axe blade and a spike. It had two hand guards also. It was fired from the waist position. In hand-to-hand -hand work, one lunged with the bayonet in a vicious upward upthrust, following through with an upthrust of the axe blade as one rushed in on one's opponent, and then a downthrust of the butt spike, developing into a downslice of the bayonet, and a final upward jerk of the bayonet at the throat and chin with a shortened grip on the barrel, which had been allowed to slide through the hands at the completion of the downslice. I almost regretted that we could not find ourselves opposed to the Delaware axe men in this campaign, so curious was I to compare the efficiency of the two bodies. But both the Delawares and my own men were elated at the news that the Hans intended to fight it out on the ground at last, and the prospect that we might, in consequence, come to close quarters with them. Many of the gang bosses were dubious about our Wyoming policy of providing our fighters with no inertron armor as protection against the disintegrator ray of the Hans. Some of them even questioned the value of all weapons intended for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. As Warren of the Sandpipers put it, you should be in a better position than anyone, Rogers, with your memories of the 20th century, to appreciate that between the super-deadliness of the rocket gun and of the disintegrator ray, there will never be any opportunity for hand-to-hand -hand work. Long before the opposing forces could come to grips, one or the other will be wiped out. But I only smiled, for I remembered how much of this same talk there was five centuries ago, and that it was even predicted in 1914 that no war could last more than six months. That there would be hand-to-hand -hand work before we were through, and in plenty, I was convinced. And so every able-bodied youth I could muster was enrolled in my infantry battalion and spent most of his time in vigorous bayonet practice. And for the same reason, I had discarded the idea of armor. I felt it would be clumsy, and questioned its value. True, it was an absolute bar against the disintegrator ray, but of what use would that be if a Han ray found a crevice between overlapping plates, or if the ray was used to annihilate the very earth beneath the wearer's feet? The only protective equipment that I thought was worth a whoop was a very peculiar device with which a contingent of 500 Altunas was supplied. They called it the Umbra Shield. It was a bell-shaped affair of inertron, counterweighted with ultron, about eight feet high. The gunner who walked inside it carried it easily with two shoulder straps. There were handles inside, too, by which the gunner might more easily balance it when running, or lift it to clear any obstructions on the ground. In the apex of the affair, above his head, was a small turret, containing an automatic rocket gun. The periscope gun sight and the controls were on a level with the operator's eyes. In going into action, he could, after taking up his position, simply stoop until the rim of the umbra shield rested on the ground, or else whip off the shoulder straps and stand there quite safe from the disintegrator ray and work his gun. But again, I could not see what was to prevent the Hans from slicing underneath it instead of directly at it with their rays. As I saw it, any American who was unfortunate enough to get in the direct path of a disray was almost certain to go out, unless he was locked up tight in a complete shell of inertron, as, for instance, in an inertron swooper. It seemed to me better to concentrate all our efforts on tactics of attack, trusting to our ability to get the Hans before they got us. I had one other main unit besides my bayonet battalion, a long-gun contingent composed entirely of girls, as were my scout units and most of my auxiliary contingents. These youngsters had been devoting themselves to target practice for months, and had developed a fine technique of range finding and the various other tactics of 20th century mass artillery, to which was added the scientific perfection of the rocket guns and an average mental alertness that would have put the artillerymen of the First World War to shame. From the information our contact guard had obtained, it appeared that the Hans had developed a type of ground ship, completely protected by a disintegrator ray canopy that was operated from a short mast and spread down around it as a cone. 
These ships were merely adaptations of their airships, and were designed to travel but a few feet above the ground. Their repeller rays were relatively weak, just strong enough to lift them about 10 or 12 feet from the surface. Hence, they would draw but lightly upon the power broadcast from the city, and great numbers of them could be used. A special ray at the stern propelled them, and an extra lift ray at the bow enabled them to nose up over ground obstacles. Their most formidable feature was the cone-shaped canopy of short-range disintegrator rays designed to spread down around them from a circular generator at the tip of a 20-foot mast amidship. This would annihilate any projectile shot at it, for they naturally could not reach the ship without passing through the cone of rays. It was instantly obvious that the ground ships would prove to be the tanks of the 25th century, and with due allowance for the fact that they were protected with a sheathing of annihilating rays instead of with steel, that they would have about the same handicaps and advantages as tanks, except that, since they would float lightly on short repeller rays, they could hardly resort to the destructive crushing tactics of the tanks of the First World War. As soon as our first supplies of inertron-shielded rockets came through, their invulnerability would be at an end, as indeed would be that of the Han cities themselves, but these projectiles were not yet out of the factories. In the meantime, however, the ground ships would be hard to handle. Each of them, we understood, would be equipped with a thin, long-range disray mounted in a turret at the base of the mast. We had no information as to the probable tactics of the Hans in the use of these ships. One sure method of destroying them would be to bury mines in their path, too deep for the penetration of their protecting canopy, which would not, our engineers estimated, cut deeper than about three feet a second. But we couldn't ring New York with a continuous mine on a radius of from five to fifteen or twenty miles, nor could we be certain beforehand of the direction of their attack. In the end, after several hours' discussion, we agreed on a flexible defense. Rather than risk many lives, we would withdraw before them, test their effectiveness, and familiarize ourselves with the tactics they adopted. If possible, we would send engineers in behind them from the flanks to lay mines in the probable path of their return, providing their first attack proved to be a raid and not an advance to consolidate new positions. End of chapter 2